Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, Thursday. It is Thursday uh, afternoon hammer time. Uh, today, Case Western Reserve University is the host, and it is my pleasure to introduce our uh, primary speaker is uh, Dr. Baudry from Lincoln Electric, and he's going to talk to us today about his work and how they're interacting with uh, Hammer. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can. Let me share my screen next. Okay. See my screen as well now? Yep, we can see your screen. See the right screen. Now we can see just your slide. Slide, perfect. <clears throat> Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to come today to talk about uh, some of the work we are doing on the additive side. Uh, some of you may have seen some of these slides, so I apologize if this is uh, kind of a repeat for some of you, but hopefully there are some new things here that uh, I can share. So I'm not sure how many in this group uh, know us. Um, Lincoln Electric, we are a welding company primarily, but the last probably 15 to 20 years, we've kind of uh, diversified quite a bit uh, from making welding consumables to making um, uh, doing doing large scale automation, uh, robotic automation, and then in the last four to five years, uh, we've kind of expanded into the additive space with uh, wire arc additive. So a quick kind of a, uh, an introduction of what we have here in Cleveland. We have a 3D printing center uh, that has about 18 cells today uh, running wire arc additive um, and a couple of cells, actually one cell with a laser arc, uh, laser additive cell as well. And the intention is to add six more cells sometime this year. And uh, they are all kind of structured very similarly with a positioner, uh, so it can go up to you know three, three, more than 3,000 pounds, five feet high. Uh, the critical pieces of uh, of our uh, system, uh, obviously, uh, there is there is there is the welding piece which we bring in as uh, as a core competency. But uh, the key piece for us is this Catapad software called Sculptprint uh, on OS, and that software is a, is a voxel based software that we use for slicing, dicing, path planning, and uh, and and looking at non planar kind of print uh, uh, methodologies. Um, uh, we think this gives us an advantage uh, to be nimble and adaptive in terms of uh, path plans and look at uh, non-planar printing strategies that are critical for making complex parts. Um, this is a quick kind of a um, video that kind of tells you uh, the the, uh, the control that we have and the, the ability to position the part as much as possible. Um, so. You have gravity as your friend when you're constructing these large builds. So our base competencies are, it's because it's wire-based, the resolution is limited by the wire diameter. I would say uh, the thumb rule I typically tell people is it's about two to three uh, X the diameter of the wire is the resolution of the part that you can, you can look to build. Uh, but our advantages are that we can build fast, we can build large parts, and with fair degree of control. Um, for the group, I mean, feel free to stop me at any time. Hopefully this is more of a kind of a discussion than a one, than a presentation. But I'll try to go fast so we have time to kind of talk about things if we want to. Uh, we have an expanding portfolio of industrial metals. I know a, lot, a significant part of this group uh, are metals, materials people. Um, and the the again the 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 the, the disc, when I have discussions on wire arc additive, I typically say if it's weldable, it is depositable, and it it kind of gets uh, aligned with additive manufacturing of metal, large scale additive manufacturing. We've done a lot of work on steels because that's our core competency: stainless as well as mild steels, low alloy steels, tool steels. Uh, 
um, expand it to the nickel space, and you'll see a couple of case studies using nickel alloys. Um, we've done uh, some cobalt alloys. We've done some um, uh, some 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 um, uh, uh, some aluminum, but not much uh, um, so far. And that's generally been uh, uh, the market pull has kind of driven us in different directions. Again, the idea why Lincoln Electric got into wire arc additive is we think we have the pieces of the puzzle that are needed to be successful in this. So we see this as an extension of what we are rather than a new space that we are getting into just because it's hot or new. Uh, this is where I'd probably spend my most uh, of my time on in today's meeting. Uh, I'd like to kind of give a, hopefully a good picture of where the challenges are. Um, with that comes the opportunity for a group like Hammer with the intellectual potential and the capabilities in the group to kind of be impactful uh, to solve some of these big challenges. Um, qualifications and approvals is, is, is a major challenge in the space. Uh, you will see some, some examples of the amount of data that's generated on a an alloy system on a material system which you would consider as very simple um, and 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 then you can you can think of extrapolating it to uh, more complex more uh, unknown kind of materials and how and and, and that comes with uh, and the, the, therein lies the challenge of getting them qualified getting them approved so it can go into a real part um, so um, I'll, I'll give you a couple of case studies uh, on, 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 on the type of work that we're doing on the qualifications and approval side. Feedstock process development, um, this is obviously where uh, we would like to spend the most time on, uh, personally and professionally, uh, to look at material process microstructure optimization. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the work we're doing on the uh, INVAR and uh, 718 side. Um, then uh, the, the two big challenges to me are defects and distortion. Um, yeah, it, it is absolutely imperative for a business like ours where we are a 24-7 operation running 18 cells to be able to print uh, clean the first time we are printing these large parts. Some of these parts, as you will see, are quite large, and you make a mistake, you're starting from scratch. Um, and we can't afford to do that uh, uh, for, the, for, for some, of, some of these materials. Post-deposition machining challenges are also a, a big piece of the puzzle to me, um, and we'll talk about finding the part within the part and, it, and, and what it means when you cannot find the part within the part um, in, in, in the presentation as well. So the first kind of challenge, I would say, is on the adoption side. Um, and, 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 and to me, if you go into the welding world and, and start talking about additive, um, most people in the industry will say, oh, we've done this since the 70s. We, we, we've always had a robotic uh, machine and we've path planned it layer by layer and been able to build large parts when we need it. But um, the key here is that uh, you can do it repetitively, you can do it robustly, and be able to say that that part is equivalent to a cast or a forged part that you're currently using in production. That's the key difference. And so uh, we've kind of teamed up or we've partnered, uh, we've, we've kind of um, uh, partnered closely with ASME to kind of develop the rules that um, are already in Section 9 uh, of uh, the ASME code and try to expand it to uh, wire arc additive. And uh, the work we've done with them uh, has resulted in a code case that's published, uh, which talks about this bracketed qualification of, uh, of, uh, of parts where you're kind of taking two extremes and procedures, qualifying the part for those two extremes and procedures, and then saying anything between those two extremes is now good enough, uh, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a qualified procedure for you to go build the part. That's in a very simplistic way, that's, that's, that's what bracketed qualification is. Um, and from a material specification standpoint, and anybody who's been in additive has seen this, uh, where everybody wants to build a part, but they, all, they want to build a part with exactly the same material they're currently using um, in terms of a casting or a forging. 
And if you are a welding person, you say, you, you'll immediately say, hey, that's the wrong direction to take. Uh, what you'd want is something that's deposited to be of the same material equivalency uh, as your casting or forging. So uh, we're, we're, we're working again with, uh, with um, ASME uh, to come up with this equivalence approach of saying, hey, if you have an A516 grade 70 or a WC9 casting, or a stainless forging, then equivalent of that is X, Y, or Z. And in order to do that requires um, due diligence and discipline, and some of the work we've done, this is an example of the amount of metal that we have deposited. And, and if, you know, again, if you're a metallurgist or a material science person, this is, you know, you should be drooling, right? I mean, this is, Loads of data, looking at the material material in different ways, understanding uh, the variation in material properties as a function of multiple variables. This is what we, we, we at least what I like to do, I guess. Uh, so we, we do this quite a bit internally, um, and uh, we've had uh, interns, co ops, uh, some of uh, Jennifer's students, some of John's students from CASE have come through um, uh, our additive lab, helped us print some of these blocks, get them tested. We have collaborations with Oak Ridge National Labs. Uh, we have a CRADA with them where uh, uh, <clears throat> Yuki, uh, who's a materials person there, and the materials people before him have helped us do this type of assessments for different material systems. And you'll see some examples in the next few slides. The first kind of uh, case study um, I, I'm going to talk about is, uh, is a recent success story, and this is pretty high profile for us. Uh, we partnered, Chevron came to us uh, in early 2022 where they needed um, uh, replacements for several components. Um, and, and end of, I think it was end of 2022 when they had a serious issue of to avoid a significant shutdown where they wanted a uh, alloy 800H um, re uh, ca a replacement for a furnace header. Um, so they came to us, we looked at the material specification, we looked at what the equivalent of 800H is, came up with alloy 617 as a potential replacement, and in four weeks, this was printed, tested, and then it was implemented in production. And this, this, is, this is a big success story for both the, the technology as well as uh, as well as for both Chevron and us. Um, the, it, required, um, it required us to uh, do some hydro testing of it, and they had, um, they, we collaborated with Stress Engineering Services in Houston, who did, uh, who did, who did uh, a lot of NDT analysis of using phased array ultrasonics in critical areas, acoustic emission and radiographic inspection. Um, and, 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 and I say this because um, this is going to be a critical uh, kind of a gap in adoption of this technology as we move, move forward is this non-destructive assessment of these large parts. We also did sacrificial articles where we took samples from different, P, different parts of the uh, sacrificial article, and uh, you can see the number of kind of pieces that were cut out of this, uh, this, uh, this sacrificial article, which itself is... Is, 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 is quite a bit of work to, to go and get this kind of data um, put together in a short period of time to convince ourselves and Chevron as well as the uh, approval body uh, to say this is qualified to be in service. Um, what it resulted in um, is a successful delivery of a large scale pressure component uh, in a very short period of time. It was completed in accordance with this ASME 320, 3020 code case qualification procedure, which involved bracketed qualifications, and, and, and as well as uh, uh, with API 20S. And, uh, and I think uh, Dr. Rob read to you from Chevron, uh, this is for the, uh, the broader Hammer group, I think is willing to maybe come on one of these, uh, one of these uh, discussions and just give his perspective on what it mean, what it what is needed to get something qualified as per API and ASME if people are interested in. Uh, inspection techniques such as UT and RT are, are going to require modification and qualification, especially if it's going to be used on as printed BAM surfaces. This I think again um, as a as a as a engineering uh, uh, research center or as a university kind of uh, research focus, uh, 
um, this might be something that uh, people may want to think about uh, to try and figure out how to how how we establish this as a establish this technique for production purposes. Um, the second uh, case study I have is on 718. Um, this is uh, uh, for the for the for uh, for the non-materials people. It's a nickel-based super alloy. It's age hardenable. Um, um, it's it's a it's a candidate material for both aerospace and oil and gas for slightly different types of applications. The oil and gas folks want corrosion resistance and hydrogen embrittlement resistance. The aerospace folks want creep resistance. So it's both high temperature as well as corrosion resistance are the two kind of areas where this particular alloy is used in, depending on what type of heat treatments you um, you put this uh, put this alloy through. It's a beautiful alloy, right? I mean, it's a complex chemical makeup. Um, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a steels person, but I fell in love with 718. It's uh, such a nice, uh, such an interesting alloy. I'm sure there are other nickel alloys which I don't know much about, but. Uh, this was a uh, this was this was uh, this was uh, an interesting venture for us because this kind of pushed the boundaries from a wire arc additive standpoint for us uh, because as you'll see there were some defects when we started depositing it and we had to figure a way to get around it um, and we are in a position now to make um, sound deposits but the material characterization and adoption is still uh, still 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 uh, probably a couple of years away. <clears throat> so uh, 718, I mean, um, it, it, as I said, there are two different kind of heat treatments that uh, folks uh, buy for or are, 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 are looking at. One is a material that's about 120 KSI, and another is a material that's about 150 KSI. Uh, and that depends on what application that this material is used for, whether it is uh, it's for high temperature uh, creep or is it for corrosion resistance. Um, and 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 the the microstructure is complex, uh, and 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 you, if you are not careful, you can you can get into some some challenges with respect to uh, with respect to cracking, as you'll see. Uh, so the first step for us to kind of establish the 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 the, the, uh, the feasibility of this particular material for large fire arc additive deposits was to develop a print strategy. That we can use to successfully print 718, and uh, Professor Bud Bazelak at Case helped us kind of uh, uh, give us some in initial guidelines on how to how to uh, move forward. Uh, and he's done a lot of work in his past life uh, in the space, so it was very useful for us to have that kind of resource next door to brainstorm. Uh, one of John's students, uh, Hannah Sims, who's now at uh, uh, at uh, Los Alamos, uh, did a lot of this work for us initially. Uh, and we looked at uh, uh, effect of post-well heat treatments on mechanical properties and microstructures. Um, and, and again, uh, if you can if you can look at uh, uh, you know the wire composition versus the rod composition, they are similar but not identical. Um, uh, so um, we, we we started off with a commercial 718 alloy, and what we did as as welding people do is to figure out if we can make a good deposit in in a traditional spray transfer type procedure a spray transfer is generally tuned towards high deposition rates fast printing which in general is uh, these types of alloys uh, are suspect when it comes to deposition but we wanted to figure out where it fails how how far we can push it because when we are making these large additive parts one of the things is we want to weld continuously and we want to minimize the number of interruptions that you have during the build, because every interruption is a source for a defect. So we, we try, and and so we 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 path plan so that we we start and stop at areas which are less critical. We try to minimize the starts and stops. We tend we try to stagger the stops and stops so they are not all all kind of one on top of another. So there's a lot of path planning strategies that goes into figuring out um, a sound uh, deposit uh, plan. And the first thing we saw was, you know, classical um, uh, uh, interdentic segregation related uh, cracking in, in 718. And, 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 and obviously, I mean, you, you go to the Bible and you look at uh, what's being done to, to, to uh, understand uh, how, where, where this particular alloy is weldable and where this alloy is not weldable. Um, and we, we, we use that as a basis. You couldn't really kind of replicate that procedure for the type of work we were doing, 
the work uh, a lot of people have worked on laser deposits of 718 uh, so we had to adopt it adapt it for wire arc additive and were able to come up with our equivalent of a pv map which is more on the heat input versus velocity side and looking at where our procedures are uh, robust enough to create sound deposits and when we when we did the deposits in the in the obviously in the as deposited condition it still has significant uh, segregation of uh, uh, of niobium and molybdenum in the interdendritic regions. Um, the hardness was low, which is what is expected. Uh, we tried different heat treatments, um, and and when and and one of the heat treatments was targeted towards this 150 ksi heat treatment, which was one of the, one of the key application requirements. Uh, we were able to achieve that, and it also resulted in 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 uh, in in, uh, in a more homogeneous kind of a microstructure. What you see in, uh, in, in these maps below are the hardness maps in the as-printed solution annealed and heat-treated conditions, and you can see the, see the, see the, see the change from, uh, from, from when it's in as-printed, it's around 250, 260 hardness, and then when you solution anneal it, it drops much and becomes more homogeneous, but it doesn't get rid of the uh, interdendritic homogeneity as much. Uh, and then when you heat treat it, you get a much harder microstructure because of the um, uh, precipitation hardening that happens in 718. Um, we have a crater, as I said, with Oak Ridge National Labs, um, and we have the for, we, are, we, we are fortunate to have a fantastic metallurgist there, Dr. Yukinori Yamamoto, who is actually working with us on this in this area to look at the effect of heat treatments on um, mechanical properties of 718 deposits. Uh, we have not completed this work yet. This is still ongoing, uh, but what we see is pretty promising. We are getting in enough ductility in this material even after heat treatment, um, high, high enough yield and tensile strength um, uh, for some of these applications which this focused on and, and defect-free deposits, which are the three kind of criteria for us before we <clears throat> proceed further. Uh, the work that he is doing also suggests that anything about 1093C, you are able to get rid of this dendritic structure related to elemental segregation. Um, and at 1200 degrees C, uh, you, you, you seem to be getting a much more homogeneous uniform microstructure. And, and obviously, the mechanical properties at room temperature seem to be uh, uh, meeting the requirements that are needed as well. Uh, again, um, this is some SEM work which was done, which, 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 which consistently kind of tallies with the classical welding literature uh, of 718, where uh, you know you form delta phases or lava phases in the as deposited condition. You need to solutionize them and homogenize them, and then heat treat them pro in, in, in at the right right temperatures to precipitate the gamma 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 double prime to get you the strengths up, uh, which is what we are seeing here as you go from 1030 to 1149 to uh, sorry 1030 1093 1149 and 1200 degrees C. So uh, all of these are now heat treated um, and 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 have been machined. The samples have been tested at room temperature for strength ductility. Uh, the next step is to look at high temperature property assessment and environmentally assisted cracking. We are collaborating with uh, DNV in Columbus, who has done some initial EAC work, which suggests that the hundred and the the uh, the twelve the twelve uh, the uh, heat treated seven eighteen deposits, um, which gave us about one hundred and forty ksi in tensile strength, are very similar to rot in terms of hydrogen embrittlement and fatigue crack growth rate, but still a lot more work needs to be done. Uh, we have not nearly done as much work in this space as we have done in the low alloy or the six seventeen space. Um, the third case study, I would say, and uh, I hope I'm okay. Yeah. Uh, the third case study, I would say, is on uh, what we have done. Is this is from a couple of years back, where we did work on Envar, which is 36% uh, nickel alloy uh, for aerospace tooling. And obviously, the the beauty of this alloy, um, as its name suggests, is it's got very very low coefficient of thermal expansion. So this is a great material for making layup tools for aerospace composites, um, uh, uh, heat treatments, and curing. 
um, and 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 the the beauty of wire arc additive or any additive is that you can make the support structures that are needed. So in this particular case, we were able to build the crate. Uh, the egg crate kind of uh, uh, support structures that are needed so they can go in directly into a furnace um, and, and not have any other additions. Um, uh, and, and, and the work we've done uh, on this material and, and uh, uh, suggests that we are able to meet the coefficient of thermal expansion requirements. Uh, we, we looked at uh, different, uh, different regions, the XYZ, the, the, the anisotropy in this material, and none of that seemed to suggest that we, we are going to have any issues. And that's another beauty of uh, this particular additive technology is we hardly see um, any, um, uh, any um, uh, significant anisotropy because of the way the grains, are, uh, grains grow and the multiple passes that are put in. Um, so I think uh, this, this is another material which is, I, I would say, is higher up the TRL level in terms of acceptance for us. Um, and, and, and is ready for prime time. However, uh, we, we do have some, 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 some challenges with uh, making uh, large builds with this material as well as other materials. Um, and, and this is an example of one of the uh, face sheet is what, is, what, it's, what it's termed as um, in the industry, uh, which was built and you can see that the amount of uh, uh, overbuild that we need um, is, is about is almost as big as the amount of material that, that is needed to be deposited for the structure. And this is uh, primarily for a couple of reasons. One, um, you, you are going to machine these parts, so you need to, need to have some overbuild. Uh, 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 but uh, but we, 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 we also tend to build um, significantly in certain regions because of the amount of distortion we see as you, as you build these large parts. And, and, and this is a... Um, uh, prototype kind of a shape for us, uh, which we've used many, many times over so far to look at and assess the amount of distortion that happens in these parts. Uh, so for example, uh, this is one of these builds that, uh, that you see uh, um, uh, that was built um, in, in multiple sections. Um, and and, and this, is a, this is a 3D scan of the final part. And you can see we, we get about a 14.3 milli millimeters uh, off in uh, in one side and 17, 18, almost 18 millimeters off on the other side. So, so you're talking about um, uh, more than half inch off, um, um, uh, uh, half inch of distortion. So you're 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 you're, you're you end up uh, putting in a lot more material on these on these deposits so that you can find the part within the part. Because if this part deflects, uh, then you are, you are kind of in, in, a, in a pickle uh, because when you start machining it, you're not going to be able to make the shape that you need. So uh, we've spent over the last two and a half to three years, um, we, uh, we've spent quite a bit of time trying to understand um, what, what are the essential variables that, um, that, that, in, that, 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 that controls distortion in these large parts. And there's a lot of obviously um, experience that we, 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 we've used from our from our from our from the background that we have on the welding side to manage this. Uh, but I would say uh, it still is 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 a is, is is an art more than a science for us to to figure out um, how much material you know. What is the right shape that we need to build this so that after after the after the part is uh, taken off the base material base plate, uh, we know that it's going to distort. We uh, but if we can predict how mu how much and where it's going to distort, then maybe we can plan accordingly. And some of these builds uh, will take three to four days for us to build it. Um, so and then you machine the base plate off, and then if we find out that the uh, the we cannot find the part within the part, then you're back to square one. Or you have to do some adjustments to um, either either mechanically or you have to add material in certain certain locations in order to build it up again. So this is a is one of I would say our biggest challenges today is to um, is to be able to to predict distortion before we build it and maybe come up with some kind of a compensated model that we can build um, that that would that would help us manage distortion. Uh, 
I, 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 there is, we know it's going to distort, but as long as we can predict how it's going to distort, then we have a better chance of finding, finding the part within the part, as I said. So in order to kind of push the boundaries on this, um, uh, what uh, we decided to do was uh, to come up with a generic part that, um, uh, uh, that we, can, we can use to benchmark different solutions that were available in the market, as well as use it to uh, use it to build our own solution uh, using you know collaborative uh, programs like Hammer to uh, to figure out if we can uh, come up with a tool that we can use. Uh, so this blanket uh, curved blanket is what uh, what we used as a as a as a as a model kind of shape. Uh, this has all the critical requirements for us. It's thin, large aspect ratio. It's got some curvature in some different directions. So uh, if the model, whichever who, the simulation model can predict the distortion in this shape, we felt comfortable that we had a solution on our hands. So we use this as a, as, a, as, a, as a kind of a shape that we wanted to send it out to people, ask for solutions from different vendors and assess uh, what is out there from a state-of-the-art modeling assessment. And, um, without naming names, I'm, I'm just giving you an idea of uh, the different, um, people, different, different approaches people have come up with and what uh, the cost of it is and what the accuracy of it. I mean, the, the fundamentally, I would say after, after a year, year and a half, we came to the conclusion that we don't have any off-the-shelf solution that works for us. Um, and, and, and most of it was, uh, I mean, apart from the cost of it, it's just not, was not accurate or fast enough for us. For us, accuracy and speed are two big uh, pieces, right? I mean, you want it to be accurate or at least directionally accurate, um, and you want it to be fast because what we want to do is when we get a design from a customer, we want to be able to task plan in Sculprint, which is our software, and say this is how we're going to build. We want a model that can predict um, the distortion in that particular, in, in that particular, using that particular path plan, and and come up with, quote unquote, a compensated model because we know it's going to distort, and then we can then use the compensated model back in Sculprint to go build the path for the compensated model. We want it, all of this done in a one-shift operation, so the engineer, when he starts the day and when he ends the day, he can put in the new path, compensated model, hit print, and go home and allow the, the system to work on its own. So that's, that, that from, a, from, a, from a technology standpoint, that's where we want to be. We want to be uh, directionally promising, we want it to be fast, and we want it to be uh, able, we want we want our operators to be able to run this program because we have 18 cells, we have engineers, but most of the time the engineers are the ones who are going to pass the plan. So the engineers are good um, good at path planning, but uh, not necessarily good enough to do a finite element simulation in three hours or four hours. So it needs to get us to a point where we can get there as a tool. I know that's um, uh, Sounds like a pipe dream, but that's where we are. That's where we need to get to. Um, so, so we we decided um, at that time that because of our inability to find an off-the-shelf solution, um, how am I doing on time, Jennifer? You have a few more minutes. Five minutes, ten minutes. Uh, you can go ahead and finish with your five minutes, and we'll let it open it up for questions and, yeah. and call it good to go. Okay. Yeah. All right. So yeah, so what we did was we um, we did a multi-physics approach. Um, we have some in-institute data that we are generating at Lincoln. We have some collaborations going with different universities as well as with Oak Ridge. Um, and the idea was to collect data about how the part is built, including position, current, energy input that can go into some kind of a thermal model. Uh, we can have some institute data collection to look at robot data, acoustics, IR imaging. This work is being done at University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, Professor Bradley Jarrett's student is working on this um, uh, using these different uh, techniques. And we have another collaboration with Georgia Tech where uh, they have Sculprint, uh, where they're going to use 
uh, use it to kind of develop some machine learning models and compare it to off-the-shelf simulations and come up with some kind of a grading system which we can use to refine our models. So that uh, is where we are uh, today and with challenges with respect to qualification, with respect to feedstock development, and with respect to um, minimizing uh, rebuilds and minimizing distortion and defects in our systems. We have shown successful delivery of large-scale components. Um, we do need very disciplined data programs. I you know, call it job security for the materials folks. And then we think we, it's still welding, so we need robust strategies for making defect-free deposits, but you've seen a defect with a, in a material system that's welded, uh, you probably are gonna see it in the additive space. So things like solidification cracking, cold cracking, lack of fusion, lack of penetration, which has been studied for many, many years on the welding side are going to be seen in these additive systems and you need to be aware of it. You need to make adjustments or, or balance the risk with the, with, the, with the requirements. And inspection, defect mitigation, distortion management are big challenges. We need complementary tools to be developed. They need to be fast, they need to be accurate. Hopefully they'll be not very expensive. So I think uh, Hammer can play a very critical role in all of these challenges because got the right group of people, the right set of kind of competencies uh, within the organization. So I'm hoping to um, make a big dent in this problem, no pun intended. That's about it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Badri. I think we'll open it up to questions uh, from the Hammer audience. Scared everybody or bored everybody? I guess so. Everybody's, you know, quiet today. Steve, do you have a question? You turned your camera on. Hey, hey, Badri, this is Steve. Steve. So, um, if you had like, I, 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 like, if you had a magic wand, right, and could solve one problem tomorrow. Right, what, which one would it be? Is it your distortion model or is it, you know, is it something? Um, I would say, I mean, I would say it in situ, I mean, defect detection and distortion are two, are both important. Uh, from a qualification standpoint, both are equally important. Distortion is important from a productivity, commercial acceptance of this particular, uh, you know, as a, as a commercial entity, I would say distortion is super important for us. And I think it's going to be more important from a residual stress assessment as well, but we haven't gotten to those applications yet, but doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It's just that we haven't gotten to those applications yet. So I would say if you want one, I would say you should, I mean, it would be nice to focus on distortion and residual stress. Um, okay. There are lots of people working on it. It's just not fast enough or accurate enough today. Yeah, well, I mean, you're you're in a, a whole lot of classic problems there, right? You know, you've got, you know, uh, uh, hardening and residual stress and uh, spring back and all all coupled together. So, yeah, I, and again, um, I mean, from an from a, from a science standpoint, we want to be super accurate, but from an engineering standpoint, we want to be directional. And I'm very happy with directional solutions today. <laughs> okay, thanks. Great. Robert, do you have a question? Yes, hi, Vadri, this is Robert Gao from Case Western Reserve University. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have uh, one question about your, your, I see you collect uh, in situ data. Uh, do you have any online control uh, algorithms built in or do you control anything or is it uh, the process largely a open loop process? Um, so from a, from a deposition strategy standpoint, there are certain things that we do control. Um, that is, you know, the current voltage signals have some, 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 the power source does control the current and voltage signals. Uh, we have what's called an adaptive bead width 
um, control. So you, we, we have we have the ability to vary the width of the the layers, uh, width of each pass, to kind of manage bead shape. Um, I didn't talk about it. Um, uh, uh, we have something called digital bead modeling that kind of models the shape of the bead as uh, as a function of the different input parameters, and we use that to kind of say make sure that there are no empty spaces in your build, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, occasionally we will find that we need to add an additional layer in some as as you start building it up, you'll find out that you need an additional layer somewhere, so you don't have empty space. So our we do have that kind of uh, in situ control. Where we don't have in situ control is the things that matter from the big challenges that I'm talking about, which is temperature gradients. Uh, dis, uh, displacement um, of the part as a function of the build, which are the two key pieces of information that you need to feed mm -hmm. into your uh, residual stress or distortion model. And that's the piece that you know, uh, Professor Bradley Jared's group at UTK, as well as Chris Saldana's group at Georgia Tech, uh, both of them are kind of looking at either you know, mm -hmm. bomb sensors or time of flight sensors um, to, to kind of see if you can get displacement data. Very challenging, I would say, because it's high temperature. Um, things don't work for the uh, uh, when the temperature goes up and there's reflectivity and emissivity issues. Hmm. Just a follow-up question: What is the time requirement uh, for your controller to act uh, in time to basically make the uh, adjustment needed? Um, I guess it depends on what you're trying to control. Our power waves, uh, the power sources, ha have the ability to, it's in the kilohertz, hundreds of kilohertz mm. uh, is, the, is the frequency at which they collect the data and respond. Uh, but that's more of uh, the welding kind of process controls that we, we tend to think of, whether it is managing um, arc length, uh, heat input, things like that. Um, uh, when it comes to these layer by layer controls, interpass temperature controls, that's we don't we acquire one or a few data points per layer, right? I mean that's mm -hmm. very slow. We don't need to acquire at very high rates because that doesn't change that dramatically, and we don't think that matters. I guess at this point in time. Thank you. You. So what was the? You showed the Chevron API. Um, what was the, how much testing goes into validating that? Are you, is it 10,000 observations of something or, or not? And how does the base allowable for testing and validation change if the part is aerospace versus oil and gas? <laughs> yeah, so we obviously we lucked out that the first application that Chevron chose was was uh, one not fatigue controlled, right? I mean, it's it's not uh, they didn't, it, fatigue was not a major issue there for them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for example, for our just our low alloy steels, um, I would say that we have 15 weeks of deposition, which goes into creating enough material to qualify for an ASME code, right? I mean, it's not a part qualification. This is just a material qualification. That's 15 weeks. For the part qualification, it depends on the application and depends on the risk that goes into it. So we are currently um, looking at some um, offshore kind of structures that we want to build, like tubes for offshore structures. We're, lo we're looking at resonant fatigue tests. Um, um, those you have to build it at the size of the component that you're going to put out in the ocean and then go do resonant fatigue in Houston. So you're looking at three months, four months to just do that testing. Um, so it, it, it varies, I would say. Uh, but from a material qualification standpoint, I would say 15 to 20 weeks is normal for us in terms of data. OK. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Bondry? Uh, Jennifer, I can't hear you if you're talking. I said, are there any more questions for Badre?
Well, if not, um, I'm almost tempted to give everybody their 10 minutes back at the end. Our final, our secondary speaker um, is out with COVID and I could present on uh, my work on 706, but I don't think I can possibly give you um, the talk is is not going to be a 10 minute talk and there is only 10 minutes left so i'm tempted to give everybody their 10 minutes back um, and call the meeting early. Um, and so with that, I would like to thank everybody for coming um, is there anybody that needs to announce a administration administrative. Uh, announcement while everybody is on the phone or should we just call it a day. I, I do have one really quick thing. Um, just a reminder, and they may not know this, is Northwestern will be hosting the next Hammer Time. So Felipe will be reaching out to the Northwestern group, uh, but that will be coming, um, I believe it'd be in March. I'll have to look at the exact date. So we'll, we'll be sending out reminders. Great. With that, I will call it an end and uh, we can, you know, virtually clap Audrey for participating and and um, letting us all listen and, and hear what uh, Lincoln Electric is doing. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Felipe, you can stop the recording now. <laughs>